Hey adults, so most of us are aware of at least one animal companion to the Commander-in-Chief. All but three presidents have owned some kind of pet during their term, and there's good reason for that. Not only does a lovable mutt serve to humanize an otherwise larger-than-life figure, but their cute antics can also be a great distraction when needed. Huh? Drone strikes? Never heard of her. Hey, we're doing a photo op with this dog that shares a name with my vice president's son, cause you know, that's not weird at all. But as it turns out, dogs and cats are just the tip of the iceberg. There have been a lot of quadrupedal occupants of the White House, even without Miss Lewinsky. So today, we'll be going through just a few of the more interesting ones. Going back to the beginning, Washington had critters galore, including four black and tan slur hounds that he named Drunkard, Taster, Tippler, and Tipsy. They sound like if Santa's reindeer were all alcoholics, which would be a shame because Rudolph's red nose would no longer be of note. John Adams had three dogs that presumably spanned the alignment chart, being named Juno, Mark, and Satan, respectively. Not a joke. Jefferson kept around 40 sheep during his presidency, one of which was a four-horned Shetland ram. Though named said Ram soon became famous for killing a young boy on White House grounds. Rather than immediately destroying the animal as we'd expect today, Jefferson just had it moved back to Monticello. It was eventually put down, but only after it single-handedly killed several other rams at the estate, which just goes to show how Jefferson operated. Random child, not the best optics, but that can be forgiven. But my own property? That's a bridge too far, Rambo. John Quincy Adams' wife Louisa practiced sericulture, which is a fun word for silkworm keeping. As a side note, sericulture has been going on since at least 3630 BC, which is kinda nutty, cause that means we domesticate worms to turn their goo into clothes before we figured out how to ride a horse. Jackson had an African gray parrot named Paul, short for Polly, that would apparently curse like a sailor, probably thanks to the teachings of Old Hickory himself. Having outlived its owner, Paul ended up being removed from Jackson's funeral service after unleashing so much profanity that guests found it genuinely upsetting. He also kept roosters for cockfighting, which was acceptable at the time and still far from the worst thing he's done morally. During Van Buren's term, the Sultan of Oman sent a variety of gifts to the president. A among them being a pair of tiger cubs. He was like, this is badass, and desperately wanted to keep them in the White House. But the dickheads in Congress asserted that, due to a specific constitutional provision, gifts to the presidential office weren't for the man himself, but for the people. Van Buren said, fuck the people, them's my tigers, and got into a legal battle with the legislator over the issue, which he eventually lost. The tigers were subsequently sent to a zoo, and over 20 years later, Van Buren died of pneumonia, completely unrelated to this incident. Although Andrew Johnson had no du jour pets, he did befriend a family of mice he found in his bedroom, feeding them flour and grain and referring to them as the little fellows. It's an oddly wholesome thing to hear from someone who essentially set the trajectory for the next 100 years of black disenfranchisement. Mr. Johnson, we still have a, uh, country to rebuild? Get out of my room, I'm getting rat-pilled! Taft had two cows during his term. The first of them was named Mooly Wooly, and she died a year and a half in after, quote, eating too many oats. Mooly was promptly replaced by the far more dignified Pauline Wayne. She was a real dime of a heifer, which led Taft to show her off at the International Dairy Men's Expo in Milwaukee. In order to get her there, she was transported in a private car attached to a train headed for the stockyards in Chicago. But a switch crew mixed up which car was hers, leading to two days of frantic telegraphs asking where the president's cow had gone. She only narrowly avoided the slaughterhouse when a couple of attendants at the stockyard recognized Pauline for what she was, and all was well. This next one requires a little background info. So the traditional Thanksgiving dinner was and remains a significant yearly ceremony for the first family. For half a century, from 1873 to 1913, the duty of providing the presidential turkey belonged to one Horace Vose, a private turkey farmer based in Rhode Island. After his death, though, things turned into a free-for-all, with numerous farmers sending unsolicited turkeys, both alive and dead, in an attempt to secure a position as the next annual caterer for the White House. Nobody was decided on for a decade, and upon assuming office in 1923, Calvin Coolidge found the volume of birds showing up at his doorstep alarming, and put an end to the tradition that year, instead opting to buy his own turkey. But in 1925, after much outside pressure, he caved and was immediately flooded with not only turkey, but a variety of increasingly exotic animals to eat. Among them was a live raccoon he received the following year. Coolidge was, at the time, blissfully unaware of the intricate dance performed on the palate between forward yet ephemeral gaminess and heady seductive musk when one submits himself to the experience of a toothsome raccoon fillet, and as such he decided to keep it as a pet instead. Dubbed Rebecca, the creature soon came to be a 
member of the Coolidge family. She ate as well as any of them, being fed things like shrimp and persimmons, and she was particularly fond of eggs. Given free reign over the house, Rebecca's hobbies reportedly included unscrewing light bulbs, uprooting houseplants, and playing with wet bars of soap in the bathtub. She was so beloved that she even had her own treehouse built for her in the White House yard. When the Coolidges made way for the Hoovers, Rebecca was forced to vacate her post, but the new first family soon found that they had a squatter on their hands. The new tenant of Rebecca's treehouse was a wild opossum who, rather than being evicted, was adopted by the Hoovers in a similar fashion to Rebecca, albeit from a farther distance, mostly just saying, yeah, that's ours now. He was given the name Billy Possum, which is a reference to our old friend Taft. See, as the man following Teddy Roosevelt in the White House, Taft had some big shoes to fill. So during his term, some enterprising young dumbasses approached Taft with what they claimed would be the sequel to the teddy bear. They called it Billy Possum, which is itself a reference to the president's fondness of possum and taters, a dish he famously requested at a banquet in Atlanta as an act of goodwill towards the South and its culture. Taft found the idea amusing enough that he gave the green light, and many thousands of Billy Possums were produced. Given their total obscurity today, it's clear these toys were a massive flop, and there's a few reasons for that. For one, trying to force fads at all is like trying to push water uphill, but also, the story of Roosevelt refusing to shoot a tied-up bear has a bit more symbolic poetry to it than, it's a possum, cause he like possum, he a fat boy, eat him up good. Couple that with the constant character assassination that the opossum as an animal has received from ignorant urbanites, and it becomes obvious that this thing was doomed from the start. But anyway, that's where the Hoover opossum got his name, and his exploits were pretty limited outside of temporarily filling in as a mascot of a local high school. In 1961, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev gifted a dog to the Kennedys, named Pushinka, or Fluffy. And while it is normally rude to look a gift dog in the mouth, an exception can be made when the single biggest threat to the free world insists that said dog should live with the president. Pushinka was x-rayed, put through metal detectors, and given ultrasounds out of fear that someone implanted her with a listening device. Fortunately, though there may be bugs in some of you mugs, there ain't no bugs in she, and Pushinka remained a Kennedy for the rest of her days. While truthfully, the gift was likely given as a simple act of good faith designed to reduce Cold War tensions, Pushinka was also the daughter of Strelka, who, during Sputnik 5, became the first mammal to make it back from space alive. So I'd like to think of it as more of a passive-aggressive space race flex. Like, yeah, our astronaut animals are so alive, they're making babies even. Hope looking at this one constantly reminds you of where you stand. With that, I hope you found this highlight real enlightening. It feels good to know that, while Congress has always been a zoo, so too has the White House at times. That's all for today. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella, and you make my girlhood tremble.